Welcome everybody to the Code Life interviews, the first of the series. Bienvenue tout le monde à la première des entrevues Code Vie. Mon nom c'est Annie Demet. I'm going to be your host uh, for the series of interviews, uh, starting with this one, of course. And we're doing this because uh, it is, of course, the 200th anniversary of the Montreal General Hospital, the MGH, which is, of course, a pioneer institute for the McGill University Health Center, the MUHC. So, of course, an important uh, anniversary. The Montreal General Hospital Foundation, in order to mark it in uh, cooperation with the MUHC and the 200th anniversary organizing committee, has planned a series of interviews, um, just various discussions to, to highlight uh, different topics, looking at healthcare uh, and, and really celebrating 200 years, looking back and also looking to the future. So uh, our theme today is innovation and it's really fitting that we're in this space. Uh, finally, live uh, in person at the uh, Zoo Studios downtown on Sherbrooke Street. It's a place that was created uh, for creators, a bit of an incubator. And so it's fitting that we're talking about innovation today because the people within the walls of the um, Montreal General Hospital have been innovating for 200 years. The physicians and all the other professionals have been innovating for 200 years and are continuing to do so. So today we have a, a panel of, uh, of people that I'm going to be speaking to who are innovators, pioneers in their own right, starting with uh, Dr. Rian Taos, who is the new director of uh, the, uh, the Research Institute of the MUHC, uh, the co-director, uh, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Taos, the new executive director and chief scientific officer of the Research Institute of the MUHC. Long and impressive title um, and, and a big mission ahead of you. So just joining the RI, we have Dr. Jail Freed, who's the co-director of the Clinical Innovation Program CLIP at the RI MUHC, among many titles, also the director of the Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning, and uh, Dr. Uh, Ed Harvey, trauma surgeon, medical entrepreneur, lots of startups under your belt uh, as founder, co-founder, so uh, a great person to speak to about innovation and, and really how to push it forward in uh, 2021 and looking to the future. So really, a great way to launch into this discussion about innovation is, is um, a new center that was unveiled today, part of a new program that I mentioned before that was called CLIP. And I want to talk to, first of all, Dr. Freed about this one because uh, it was the official opening a little bit earlier today, and this is on the ninth floor of the MGH. So we can just imagine an older building, as we know, but with a completely modernized space on the ninth floor. Tell us a little bit about the program and what you're aiming to do at the center. What can we, what can we see when we go there? Well, Annie, this is a dream come true. It has always um, been part of our mission as an academic teaching hospital, not only to provide first-class care, but advance the knowledge of the field through uh, research and innovation. And what we uh, have done was to to try to generate in people's minds the thought about how we could scale what we do every day on a one-on-one on one basis with our patients to, uh, to, to a larger group of people. And each of us as clinicians, I'm a surgeon in terms of my background, we, we have periods during our day-to-day our -day practice where we think of ideas. And you know, the thought is, can I take this idea and maybe develop a device or a, a procedure or some sort of different way of doing things that will really impact the quality and safety of the care of our patients. But we, we get a little overwhelmed at the bureaucracy of trying to do that. So what we first decided in 2013 was to start with a graduate program, take clinicians, engineers, and business students, put them together in teams, have them identify unmet needs, clinical needs, and solve the problem using technology. And to teach clinicians the skills of entrepreneurship, teach them business skills, teach them about protecting their ideas with you know, how to patent their ideas, um, teach them about business plans, what the regulatory process is, and hopefully th they would generate ideas that would be able to come to commercial success. And that program started as a pilot in 2014 and it has grown fantastically. We have brought together McGill, Concordia, and ETS, engineering school, uh, John Molson School of Business at Concordia and McGill uh, from the clinical uh, perspective, and they, they have been really successful. The second part was we got 
we got a, a grant through the uh, National Science and Ed Engineering Research Council. And the third part was to come up with a home. And this home is uh, the CLIP, and it's a facility that brings people together so that ideas can come up in, and develop solutions. And you were actually talking about a really interesting um, uh, problem, dilemma that you managed to solve with the team, right? Because you said uh, oftentimes this is created to solve problems in your, in your practice as a surgeon. And you were telling me about workarounds that you've developed over the years and finally you were able to find something suitable that for, for laparoscopy, for example. So I, I do a lot, a lot of laparoscopic surgery, which involves taking a telescope, putting it into the body and using that to, as our vision while we, while we do surgery. And the telescope would often fog up or we could get mucus or body fluids on it. We'd lose our, our vision. We'd have to take the scope out, clean it, you put it back in, it fogs up again, and it's pretty inefficient. The engineers looked at that and said, we could come up with a solution. Think about uh, broadcasting um, TV when it's snowing or raining outside. The cameras never get fogged up or dirty. They, they took the idea of, um, of what they developed in the television industry and applied it to this and came up with a solution to an unmet need. And that's the mindset that we're so excited about. Mm -hmm, that outside vision of and different people working together to, to make this happen. And so it, when you were decided, deciding what to focus on, uh, you really decided to, to work with the strengths that Montreal already has, correct? Right. Okay, so, so what, what kind of uh, field are you moving towards then? What kind of innovations, uh, I believe it's robotics and AI? So uh, the, the first thing is that our clinical innovation center is really focusing on health technology outside of uh, pharmaceuticals. Drug discovery is really a different field. So we're interested in devices and um, digital technology. Montreal, if you think about it, is a world center for gaming, for artificial intelligence, for aviation, for simulation. And so what we wanted to do is take advantage of the adjacencies and build on partnerships that we could develop between the health environment, the MUHC, and the, the environment of Montreal, the ecosystem of Montreal. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and it's, it's a, again, sort of a two-way street, right? You have uh, people, we're bringing in people from the outside as well at CLIP, right? You have, you're working with different uh, businesses who, uh, who are setting up a, a home on the ninth floor as well? That's right. So we are really have three groups of people. We have our internal community, so people within the institution that have an idea we're trying to partner them with engineers and business people to so make their ideas come into products. We have people from the outside, uh, say from engineering or entre entrepreneurs, that want a clinical partner to help them assess their technology, give them feedback, ultimately to validate their prototypes and even do clinical trials. And then we have large multinationals. So we have a company like Medicom, which is an international company that uh, develops personal protective equipment. And during COVID, they saw a great opportunity to work with us to test and validate some of their new and innovative products. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Harvey, I want, to, I want to turn it over to you a little bit um, because you're uh, on the board of directors of, um, for, for CLIP, right? You're on the advisory board, rather. And I was mentioning off the top, you were invo involved in several startups, uh, developing new devices, founder or co-founder of three at this time, I believe. So, you know, we. You were just saying, Dr. Freed, we have the program and now we have the home for it. And, and I just want to know in your experience uh, as an innovator, what's been the importance of, of having a, a home for, for, for this? Um, I believe for your very first startup, this was crucial. Yeah, I think this is a great initiative. I think the, the kind of the dirty secret is that universities aren't great at turning or translating knowledge to uh, Solutions. Uh, Jerry alluded to the fact that uh, we have a lot of problems we'd like to solve, especially as a clinician uh, scientist. Uh, we had problems to do that with. Uh, we used to do it the old-fashioned way. We'd have to get on the phone or we'd have to go down the lower campus. That's what I did initially to find someone to help me. And now with a program like this, we can make those partnerships easier and we can uh, turn, to, turn to more of the translation part, which is extremely difficult. Uh, People think academia turns out patents and turns out startups at this huge clip. They don't. They, we need something like this. Definitely, I think that 0.1 of 1% of startups in the U.S. is from an academic center. We think, oh, it must be 20%. It's mm -hmm. not. It's a tiny, tiny amount. And 
opportunities like this with the clip are what uh, young innovators need to get over that hump, for sure. I, I kind of want to go a little deeper with your, your story because I thought it was so great. Um, I think it was for um, muscle recovery and trauma, right? And right. You, were, you were telling the story about how uh, you had to go down to campus to look for a sensor. If you, I'd, I'd love to hear it again. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, we had an un unmet need. People would have muscle trauma and the muscle would die. People would end up with amputations or even dying from this problem called acute compartment syndrome. And the product that we had on the market for objectively evaluating this was basically a random number generator and it was no use to anyone. Everyone recognized it in, in, the, commu in the community at large, but I just said, <coughs> I finally got tired of it. I said, okay, I'm going down to lower campus. And I was walking through the building on McConnell and asking if anyone had a sensor that I could use that would be helpful for this. And someone finally said, yeah, yeah, go talk to a guy over in room whatever. And I walked over and he happened to be there. And we said, oh, that's great. I, he goes, I've got this sensor. And I go, I need that sensor. He goes, oh, I thought nobody wanted this. And so I said, okay, let's do something with it. And we wrote a small grant and we, start, we started solving this problem, which is problem oriented, which is what this is all about. And uh, from that small grant, we, have, we had three spinoffs, you know, which was very unusual at the time. And we've just kind of grown from there. And I think that this clip process is going to help that so much better. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, being right in the medic, you being, being in contact with, uh, with the doctors, the engineer, being in a medical setting for an incubator is, uh, it's, it's innovative in itself, of course, but is that a unique to, uh, have you seen that elsewhere in the world to have that type of, uh, program it, right in the hospital? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it, it has happened elsewhere in the world, not a lot of places. I think the Americans started at first because they, they looked at the billions of dollars that were going to research and saying, why is nothing coming out? So they did go back and reconfigure some programs like Hopkins and Stanford, MIT, reconfigured. And, and the model is very similar to what we're doing, except with a Canadian bent, of course. But uh, <laughs> we, we are, we are going to do it a Canadian way, for sure. But uh, definitely it can be done better. And I think that's what uh, the group here is going to do. And yeah. not to, to get off too sidetracked, but w what does it mean to do it the Canadian way? <laughs> well, we're not, we're not very pushy about it. We're very low key. We didn't, uh, we didn't have a flat, we didn't have flashy, uh, you know, uh, rounds of funding, which you see in the universities in the States. And we did a lot of our initial funding with friends and family and, uh, and government non-dilutive funding, which which Canadian government, Quebec government, and Montreal even has uh, helped with, which is a real help for innovation, uh, which wasn't around 20 years ago. So a lot of the groups are helping out in a big way. I think you can see that today. Bank National has donated two million dollars to the clip to uh, help with this effort. Uh, other banks have been on board in other ways, but uh, definitely a huge help from national banks. And you have to keep propelling it forward. So, so Dr. Taos, you were, you were there today. Uh, um, you've, I believe, have been the director now of the RI. It's been a matter of weeks. So this was one of your introductions to, to innovation at, uh, at the MUH, uh, MGH and at the MUHC. So what was your impression walking in there? Well, indeed, I've been in post now for two weeks. So um, coming to a new position, a fantastic new job, and to be presented with such an unbelievable opportunity to know that the CLIP is part of the research institute that I'm leading is a huge honor and a privilege. And I really need to applaud the, you know, the brains and the, um, the energy and the commitment that has been put into developing this clip. It's, it's really the innovation in itself in developing the clip. And of course, the innovation that's going to come out of the clip is huge. And so I feel very proud and, and very honored that, as I said, the clip actually is part of the Research Institute of the MUHC. So having the opportunity this morning to walk into this very modern facility um, was exciting. I almost felt that I wanted to start speaking <laughs> to the young <laughs> students there, and it, it, was, it was a lovely um, environment. And I have no doubt it will be full. Not, uh, you know, it won't take long before you have many, many brilliant minds um, occupying the, the infrastructure and the facilities. It, it bodes well. So. Uh, I want to know, how does this mesh, what you saw today, how does this mesh with the vision that you have for, for the Research Institute and, and just the way that you want to 
to, to, to steer it? Well, um, being um, the lead of a research institute, of course, research is fundamental. We are a research intensive institution. And unless you have innovation and novelty and blue sky science, um, I think advancement is very difficult. So working side by side with the ethos of the innovation in the CLIP is very much the ethos of what the Research Institute stands for. So innovation is fundamental to research. And as I said, the brilliant minds that are here in Montreal in the Research Institute, I'm sure will be able to contribute to this in innovation platform. Mm -hmm. So I'm very enthused. And as I say, it's very much the foundation of exactly what we do. And I want to get back to your vision a little bit more in a moment, but Dr. Freed, you know, you said that you, you obviously you've, you're working on a number of projects right now, but what do you hope, what's coming down the pipeline for patients, uh, for people in Montreal? What are some of the things that you're working on? You had told me about the prehabilitation program. What's that, the, tell us a little bit about that and what's that the precursor for? Well, I like to think of innovation as kind of the application of discovery to, to solve clinical problems or to improve the way we take care of our patients. And as a surgeon, um, you know, it, it is apparent to me over my own career that the time that a patient is in hospital has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. So that often a patient is only in for their, for the surgery for a few hours and their preoperative care and their postoperative care are done outside the institution or as an outpatient. What we know now is that we can prepare patients for surgery optimally using uh, an approach that we call prehabilitation. It was coined by one of our anesthesiologists, uh, Dr. Franco Carley. Uh, the concept is that in preparation for surgery and patients wait for surgery in our system, unfortunately, we should take advantage of that time and optimize them from a nutritional, uh, physical, and uh, medical perspective as well as psychologically. So the opportunity is how do you track them during that period of time where they're going through prehabilitation? In the past, they would come into the hospital three or four times a week. You would put them on various machines. You would test their exercise capacity, their you know, weigh them, et cetera. Now, with, the, with wearables and different types of sensors, we can track them continuously at home, and that, that information could be fed to us. It could be digested using artificial intelligence. And we could see whether patients follow a trajectory that we expect. That concept has been really powerful. And we've shown that using prehabilitation, we could decrease complications and even improve survival after cancer surgery. We've taken that same principle now and we're applying it to recovery after surgery so that we could monitor a patient in their own home and see that they are recovering the way we anticipate that they should. And if not, bring them back in identify what the problem is, and solve it before it becomes a full-blown complication. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the things that it would allow you to maybe identify that, that you can't right now? Uh, you're, you're, you're basing a lot of your information on, on what people report to you as well, Exactly. Correct? So uh, give us some examples of, of what it might help you do. So in, in the uh, typical um, follow-up after surgery, you would see a patient a couple of weeks later. They would report the amount of pain they've had whatever symptoms, how they're progressing. But what we can do is to be able to track how many steps are they taking? Are there, is their activity going up as you would expect? Is their temperature normal? Uh, are there, is it, what is their pain scale looking like? What are the drugs that they're taking to manage their pain? All of this is information, it's data. And if we bring this all together, we can identify the, what is a, a normal trajectory of recovery and whether a patient is deviating from that so that we could bring them in and, and try to figure out what's going on. Mm. And, what's, and what's that set up? You can really expand this to, to you know, any kind of surgery and, and, and beyond uh, any for right. different illnesses, different diseases. It's, uh, it could be a heart attack, it could be someone on chemotherapy. All, all of these situations where people have uh, a period of recovery mm -hmm. and a, a kind of an episode of intervention, all of that could be uh, monitored much more efficiently using di digital technologies and sensors. I wonder how close are, are we to that? How close is that to becoming a reality, do you think, for, for, for the patients uh, at, at the Montreal General Hospital and at the NUHC? 
Well, we've already started to pilot some of these okay. already. Yes, yeah. so There's they're not on the market yet. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but we are piloting them. We have uh, developed some apps that we're using to track patients after surgery. Mm -hmm. okay. And th I guess the challenge too, um, Dr. Harvey, is becoming the app that everybody uses. Correct? Yeah, the app that communicates with all other apps, the super app. Yeah, no, <laughs> we, we haven't got that yet. But uh, as Jerry says, we we we're approaching it step by step, not in a very flamboyant way, but I mean, we, we have the hip fracture study that we ran with uh, Suzanne Moran which, at the Montreal Journal, which was really about tracking patients that were leaving the hospital with hip fractures, and you, and you can see when they fall off or, or start to get better, and you can intervene at an earlier time. And that's the whole thing is to have meaningful data, which and not, not right now we have no data. We have two data points for two weeks and six weeks. And that's it. And then you, you have nothing else to go on. More data is better, as long as you can analyze it, as Jerry said. And, and, and this, is, this is interesting for, you know, for people watching us because it's a real practical, this is going to make such a huge difference in, in people's lives. And you're saying patients are also becoming more and more demanding. And we're living longer. We're, uh, quality of life is, uh, is extended. So we're going to need these things too, right? You know, the interesting thing is when people come for surgery, they want to know when they're going to recover. And we would always say, oh, it's, oh take it six weeks or take it four weeks. We pull these numbers out of a hat, quite honestly. But now that we have data, physiologic data and functional data, we actually can understand recovery. Recovery is really important. And so if we understand it and we can measure it, then we can we could intervene. We could accelerate recovery. And I think that's really important. And like you said, it could be applied to, to many things outside of just surgery. Um, I want to start taking some questions uh, from people who are, are joining us, either uh, watching this live or who have uh, registered for, for this talk. Um, uh, this is a pretty big one, but I, I might direct it to you, Dr. Harvey. What's, the, the <laughs> what's your advice for uh, startups who are looking for, for funding in oh healthcare? My Oh my God. It's, it's, it's sort a big of <laughs> I, oh you, you did say you, you mentioned in a previous interview teamwork, uh, building a team yeah. around you, right? I, let's hook on to that one. <laughs> so, so there's so many ways you can go right or wrong in building a startup. Or, and, and I said Clip's going to help a little bit of this. And the team is the most important thing you can do. I mean, we, we've tried to build startups in the past. And you don't get the right team, no matter how good the idea is, how, how great the problem you're solving, it won't work. So building a team is the most important thing after getting the idea. And it, it's, super, it, it's, it's like this super arcing, uh, overarching uh, kind of dome that protects your idea. You have a good team, right? And you can rely on your team. And if you have one bad person on the team, it doesn't work. Um, and finding that team is difficult. And uh, as we can, we can speak to our previous experiences for sure, but uh, part of the clip is to help build those teams and get the right people and talking with the right people. Mm -hmm. I can't overemphasize the, the team part. And people have written books about it, you know, about getting the right people on the bus is like one of the expressions. Um, the person who wrote Good to Great, he said, if you don't have the right people on the bus, you're not, your bus isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so getting the right people on the bus and making sure the wrong people get off the bus is a big part of this. Attention. And it's experience and a little bit of uh, luck, a lot of luck sometimes. So um, another question we have for, let's, let's direct this one to, to Dr. Taos, because this is going to be your challenge a little bit over the next few years, is uh, just the biggest challenge in your view facing innovation in healthcare. I have an idea of what you're going to say, but it's, I'll let you go. Well, the biggest challenge, of course, relates to the abilities to do this fantastic research. And for that, we need, of course, facilities, infrastructure, resources, and support, and financial support, very, very importantly. But I think, as Ed has just highlighted, something critical, teamwork, team science today is the way we have to go. And it's not only team building with respect to starting up a, a, you know, startup um, uh, companies, but Science has become very, very expensive. And we can't all be experts in one field. So I think bringing the expertise together and innovating through teams is the way we need to go. 
And I think also in terms of innovation and building into the cliff and to everything that Ed has said, is the importance of bringing the non-traditional um, scientists to work side by side with our clinicians, with our biologists, um, bringing the physicists, the mathematicians, the computer scientists, the engineers, even the world of art should be working together in this, um, in, in, in this world, in this ecosystem. And, and, and I, that, that guess, I guess that starts also even outside of a clip within the hospital. Um, you also, I, I believe, at, uh, in Glasgow put together a, started a, a program um, that you, you were able to formalize there that you would like to export here. <laughs> so yes. tell me a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. you'd like to, to bring it to, to Montreal. Tell us a little bit about that and what you're hoping to achieve with that. Sure. Um, again, this was... You know, when I looked around and I saw how much emphasis is put on bringing the clinicians to the lab, we, we always talk about the clinician should know what it's like to be working at the bench. And then I realized that a lot of our PhD scientists are working in clinically relevant domains but have no idea of what the disease is actually all about. They don't understand what it means to be doing research that impacts a patient and a patient's family within a clinical setting. So I realized we had to contextualize the science or the basic research that is being done at the bench in the context of the disease. So indeed, we created a program where we took our basic scientists and we started with our postdoctoral fellows, our PhDs, and we took them to the clinic and we formalized a four-month um, observership type program where they spent many hours per day in the clinic and we custom designed the program so that the program in the clinic would help them with their research interests. So it was a hugely successful program of taking the PhD to the clinic. So we've really completed, I think, that circle of translational research in taking the clinician to the bench and the PhD to the clinic. And indeed, it's a program that has been hugely successful in the UK, where I first come from, and we certainly will be developing something here. Mm -hmm. I see you nodding, Ed, I guess, because this is, Dr. Harvey, because this is, um, I, I suppose, this translational research that's even that comes even before the programs like CLIB. That's the foundation is to not yeah. have the silos, right? To no, ab absolutely. But it's also on the back end. So just at Maya One, which is one of the companies, we just started making the engineers go on sales calls, <laughs> and so it's the opposite. So the engineers were designing a device at the clinician's bequest, but didn't understand the, you know, what the consumer was doing and what the consumer wanted. So as soon as we started doing that. They, had, they came back with 20 new ideas, how to design the device better, and it was great. And I think the cliff is going to provide this foundation for bringing all these people together, and it's fabulous. It's really fantastic. So speaking of which, I have another question. Um, if uh, I want to use the cliff space, how does it work, or do you? <laughs> so they, uh, they, they need to be... A company, they they need to be incorporated. They need to have their intellectual property protected, or you know have a make sure that their idea is protectable, so that they should have some legal counsel. And then uh, they make a, a presentation with respect to what they need. Um, we don't want the clip just to be an office space for somebody, but we want people to be able to use the clip for a period of the evolution of of a company and at, with a particular purpose and, uh, and goal in, in mind. Then we evaluate it, so we have a committee that evaluates the proposals, and then uh, they can become members of the CLIP. Okay. And so um, I just want to finish by asking you, I don't know who's going to want to take this question. Or actually, Dr. Harvey, before, we, before we, we, we close, I want to ask you, again, we're talking about the doing it the Canadian way and competing. Are, are we competing against the, the Harvards and the Stanfords and the Mayo Clinics 
or uh, is it individual ideas that are emerging? Is that the important part? How, how do we, how do you see um, the people that we have in the institution that we have, the, the, the MGH and the NUHC, sort of positioning ourselves in that ecosystem? Well, we're just a little behind. Um, I mean, all of this uh, innovation ecosystem kind of originated, I think, after World War II with the Roosevelt Act, where they decided they were going to fund universities and that the universities have to give back what they, they discovered. And then it kind of was, it was brought into law in the states, and, and it became indoctrinated. And we were behind. And we've sort of caught up. And we've learned from them uh, in our own quiet way, I think. And we're, and we're doing it just as well. I mean, if you look at the uh, per capita and, and the numbers, we do great, Canadians. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we just undersell ourselves a lot. But there, I mean, definitely, they're on another order of magnitude of funding for their academic centers than we are. But th that's something you, you were saying, Dr. Drew, you need to understand, too. Um, in, in order to get to that next level, you need to bring in uh, outside partners. You need to, to bring in supporters uh, and fundraising. Yeah, you I know, I people, I think people have the expectation, oh, well, we're cutting edge, but it, you, you need more to, 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 to get to that next level. We, we always need more. I mean, there's nobody that will ever be satisfied with what mm -hmm. they have. But I, I do think that our track record has been outstanding. What we've done since 2014, really in seven years, I, I think uh, can compete with any Harvard or Stanford uh, or Hopkins. The number of companies that have emerged from our graduate program uh, I think is, is really striking. We have not hit the jackpot in terms of a company that, you know, that went public for hundreds of millions of dollars yet. But uh, I think that we have all the ingredients. And yes, we do have competition with the other ins institutions, but we also have a unique ecosystem in Montreal. Exactly. And I, I, I think that if we play our cards right and we take a world-class hospital, a world-class a research institution in a ecosystem that is strong with the capabilities of the Montreal uh, context and the support of, you know, Bank Nationale, for instance, for their vision and, and their idea of supporting people at the earliest phases and the government and being able to amplify the, the grants that we get. I really do think that we will be successful and be able to compete on the world stage. Mm -hmm. well, it already sounds like a success that you're doing this and certainly, uh, you know, lucky to have innovators and pioneers like you being the driving force behind these programs. So thank you all for, for taking part today. Um, and, and thank you for watching, for listening as well. Uh, if you want to support uh, innovative research and CLIPS, for example, as uh, one of many examples, you can make a donation to Montreal General Hospital Foundation through uh, www.codelife.ca. Just go to the website, it'll be easy from there. And uh, of course, as part of the 200th anniversary celebrations, you can really go have a look at the rich history of the MGH through a virtual exhibition. And uh, the website to do that is mgh200.com. A lot of interesting uh, facts there. And of course, stay tuned for our next Code Life interview. Celle-ci était en anglais. Vos interlocuteurs dans les semaines à venir on va avoir euh, un petit peu de, de mixité aussi, donc on va se promener entre l'anglais et le français, mais euh, joignez-vous euh, le mois prochain pour euh, des entrevues Code Vie. Thanks so much again for being with us, and see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>